morning. So first we're going to hear from Allison Muddin, who's the director of the University of California Press. And she's going to talk about the UC Press's uh, new and very exciting OA monograph publishing program called Luminous. Um, then we'll hear from Brian Holt, who's the founder and CEO of Ubiquity Press. And he's going to discuss the way in which uh, Ubiquity Press provides a platform on which others can innovate with openness. And then our third speaker will be David Parker, who's head of editorial at Alexander Street Press. And he's going to describe an interesting new initiative in open access to archival materials. Um, following them, I'll, I'll make a couple of very brief synthesizing remarks, and then we'll open up the remainder of the time to discussion. Awesome. And I would like to acknowledge that there are a lot of interesting things really happening in this space. And I'm going to focus on what we've been doing at UC Press with our Luminous program. Um, there are a lot of really interesting other programs out there from the Lab, through to a lot of things that are happening at University Press here in the US. So we started thinking really seriously about open access at UC Press a few years ago as we started to think about the digital future beyond books and journals. And we really saw this, um, and saw open access as integral to that future. It's in perfect alignment with our mission as a university press, both to democratize access to content, and also to increase the impact of the scholarship that we publish. But as we started to think about monographs, we kept on surfing back to a very series of crises, depending on who you spoke to. It was either the crisis of the monograph itself, or the crisis of the humanities, or even the crisis of the university press. And so we really wanted to unpack that to, to better understand what we were dealing with as we tried to think about models for um, digital monographs. That said, the one thing that was really clear to us was that the monograph remains a vitally important vehicle for scholarly communication in the humanities and the humanistic social sciences. And so as we thought about the monograph, we wanted to make sure that we were not only preserving the monograph, but reinvigorating it with more open digital models. So as a starting point, we sort of looked across the landscape of what was happening in open access, and we thought about what this told us about what may or may not work for monographs. And the first conclusion, this is a pretty obvious one to many people, but I think it's worth underlining, was that the golden hybrid models that had been developed were really developed for SDM journals and for fields, primarily the life sciences, where there were larger research grants to pay the cost of publication. So this brought us up against one of the first challenges for, for books, um, given A, they're more expensive, and B, they're in fields that don't have those grants. There were no obvious funding sources, certainly no single funding sources in the underfunded humanities and social sciences that were really going to be able to cover the cost of publication in the way APCs have begun to for gold OA journals. The next one, and this is really more as we started talking to faculty, is a whole series of cultural concerns about moving to, to a digital open access model for monographs. And yes, there is an attachment to print itself, but I think you know, there's a great discussion of this in Jeff Krosick's recent hefty report on the landscape for open access monographs. And he talks about an attachment to the materiality of the book and the visual grammar that is created through things like footnotes and indexes and all of the other apparatus of a book publication, all things that haven't really been well captured um, by the digital form at this point in time. Next, uh, a key concern, particularly among junior faculty, as you might imagine, the question as to whether a digital open access book will have the same legitimacy for promotion and tenure as the traditional print monograph graph. And then I think finally, um, you know, an added complexity with monographs is that we are looking to move to digital and open access at the same time. And if you think back to journals, by the time mandates became a big deal and open access became more of an issue for journals, digital had been the norm of publication for a decade or more. Um, whereas, as I said, with monographs, we're really grappling with both of those two things simultaneously. So as we started to think about what we wanted to do in the monograph space, the first thing that we set out to do was to really think about a model that would address what we identified from our perspective as the two primary concerns for monographs. The first, for presses and libraries, is that the current model is under increasing financial strain, whether you want to call it broken or not, but certainly under increasing financial strain. And the second was the issue of access. As a university press, we believe that we have a responsibility to disseminate the scholarship we publish as widely as possible. 
study to all who are interested, ideally to all who will profit from it, and very definitely beyond the 300 or so research libraries in the West who can afford to buy a monograph these days. At the same time, we wanted to make sure that we preserved what really worked so well about the monograph, and one of the things we have been very careful to do in the Luminous model is to make it clear and to ensure that um, an open access monograph is exactly the same as any other UC Press monograph in the important areas of selection, peer review, approval by our editorial committee, and the editorial development of the book. So as we started to think then about business models, we really identified the fact that this is a problem that libraries and publishers are unable to solve on their own. And so we moved back to thinking about collaborative ways to address the problem. And so the business model that we've developed is one that really shares the cost of publication among the people we sort of identify as the key stakeholders. You'll see that there is an author's contribution to that, you know, what in the journals world has become known as an APC. Um, we are assuming that comes from the author's institution. At the same time, we recognize that not all institutions are able to fund this at this point in time. There's also a library subsidy that comes from the membership model that I'll talk about more in a moment, um, but continuing subsidy from UC Press. Um, we always support all of the monographs we publish. And then there are print editions available, and so uh, we are hoping to generate revenue from, from print sales. <coughs> So as we're at a library conference, let me dive a little deeper into the, the library membership model. It is kind of, you know, in many ways, an NPR type model. Um, we have four levels of membership. Membership is, of course, completely optional for all libraries. And there are different levels of benefits to libraries at each of the four levels. The one benefit that's consistent across all of them is that faculty at member library institutions all receive a discount on that type of publication fee to, to publish within Luminance. And so the library revenue that we generate is used in two ways. The first is to help support the publication costs of the books that are published in the Luminous program. And anything that's left from that goes into a waiver fund, um, which we are using to support authors and institutions that genuinely cannot afford the costs of the publication at this point in time. So we're at a point now where we've published the first six books in the series. Um, that's all happened over the last couple of months, so um, there's not a lot of data to report at this time point in very early days. Uh, but the data is, of course, all available on the book website, so you can see exactly how many uses and downloads and so on there have been. Um, we've had a great reception um, from libraries. We've signed up a good number of library members and a really positive response from authors. And I think there are sort of two ways in which the model has really resonated among our authors. The first is among authors who want to be read and not simply published. And um, you know, the immediacy of being able to see numbers of downloads and those kinds of things, I think, would be really great for authors. And the second is among the increasing number of humanists and social sciences who are doing multimodal work and want to be able to reflect that in their publications in a way that the traditional monograph doesn't allow them to. So that said, and I'm you know really excited about what we've done with Luminous so far, and I'm very um, ambitious about where we can take it. But I do think that there are some pretty big issues for us address, to address if we really want to move open access forward. Um, and these go well beyond simply proclaiming the benefits of open access. I think the first and perhaps the most difficult one is winning over faculty opinion. And you know, we all, libraries and publishers, spend a lot of time in rooms like this talking about open access. There's a really important group of stakeholders who are not here and involved in this discussion. And you will hear very, very different things um, when you talk to them. But you know, the root of this is the entrenched value system where venue of publication is most important in the career of any academic. And um, they, like we, are human, and most of them will choose prestige over the ideals of OA. And so, you know, there's really significant changes to happen there that I think we all have to accept are going to take a very long time. The next for monographs, I think, are issues to do with licensing and rights. Um, we've adopted a pretty open approach um, offering any of the Creative Commons licenses for monographs. The OA purists might argue that anything that's not CC BY isn't real open access, but I think for us to really move forward with monographs, we have to be um, a little more open-minded than that. And then there's the technology issue. I think the experience of reading a digital open access monograph has to become a lot closer to the experience of reading a physical book for it to become an acceptable alternative. And then finally, there are the issues around business models and, and funding. 
Um, I think that we're doing a lot to sort of scaffold together what we can with Luminous and to get started and to start to address some of the real issues of moving to a digital open access model for monographs once they're well beyond how we pay for them. At the same time, I think for us to see OA Ventures scale in the way many of us would like them to, there's going to have to be some pretty significant top-down change to um, the financing of, of these models. So in conclusion, you know, I hope and think that we are um, making a real contribution with Luminous, um, along with uh, many other publishers in this space, to trying to develop sustainable models. And I hope to demonstrating that an open access monograph can be not only just as good as, but perhaps better than a traditional monograph. Thank you. Um, I was asked originally to, to talk about um, what the state of open access was when I first came to the um, So this slide symbolizes that very clearly. Um, so I, I used to work for one of the large publishers um, and uh, left there after a while to go back to UCL in London to do my PhD um, and discovered at that point that that publisher wasn't as loved as I thought they had been um, in the library and so forth. Um, but also found that um, open access was a, a big issue. Um, and I, because of my publishing experience, I was asked to help out with some of the smaller journals operating on campus. And we looked at all the, the opportunities to get them published open access. Um, and we, we couldn't find anything that cost us less than $20,000 a year with one of the, the publishing platforms. And that, that was the genesis for setting up Ubiquity Press. Um, so it felt like open access was out there, but especially in the humanities, no one could quite reach it. Um, um, and at the same time, um, I was doing my research. I'm an archaeologist, so I was working up in India um, a lot of the time. And very, very few people could access anything, even if it was supposed to be um, open access to programs like Hanari and so forth, which are very worthwhile programs, but in reality, they don't reach more than 10, 20 percent of the people. So that was a real driver for us to set up the company and get moving. Um, and so what we did is we, we set up and we aimed to be as low cost, as, or as cost efficient as possible. Um, so we set up with an ABC of around 10% that of the, the other publishers. Um, and we did that by, by using open source software for our platform, um, by being just very, very cost conscious from, from the beginning. And that was really, really critical in the humanities. Um, so we eventually got to the point now out there where we had a lot of success with humanities journals because we were, were affordable. And, societies and, and libraries were willing to pay the, the charges that we were, were asking for because we were very transparent about it. We were saying you know, we're, we're not spending money on our expensive yacht um, down the Thames. It's actually going into everything like running our office, building our platform, doing the typesetting, etc. That was very critical. Um, and then what we did is we took the platform and we decided to open it up and let other precious users as well we've become a, a fairly successful, smaller, to, you know, growing open access publisher in our own right, with books and monographs and data. So we opened up the platform and decided to let university presses take advantage of it, um, and other societies. And, and what we do generally is they, they use the, the, the platform, the software, they run the, the front office of the press, and we offer everything else in terms of the, the infrastructure, um, editorial support, typesetting, copy editing, all that kind of thing. And what we aim to do is to de-risk the, the um, university publishing for them, make it sustainable, etc., and then provide a solution for the university presses so they can take on big publishers. Um, and we do things, we, we push things automatically into institutional repositories, and, and we're building a large user base up as well, shared between all of the universities um, for peer review and that kind of thing. And that's taken off very well as well. So, um, we have, I thought I would just highlight three quick case studies. Um, because our platform is, is extremely cost efficient, it allows others to take it with low risk and allows them to innovate on top of it. So in a way, we've, we've done our bit. Now we're, we're trying to let other people come up with new uh, business models and open access, try out new things, and try to, because when open access is truly successful, it won't just be done in one particular way. It won't just be an ABC model. 
There'll be lots of different approaches depending on different disciplines and situations that make it work. So the first of those, Alison has, has already talked a little bit about the um, University of California Press uh, uses the platform. They use it for Collabora, um, which is a, a large journal that they launched where because the fees we charge are quite low, they're able to charge a little bit more and start doing things like paying peer reviews and really innovate around that model and try and come up with a, a solution that, that um, fits the, the academic community, some of the problems they've been having, not getting rewarded by larger publishers, etc. And of course, the, the Luminos platform that Alison's just mentioned. And then another one is the Open Library of Humanities. Um, once again, addressing the fact that you can't be expensive in the humanities, but if you offer things that, that reasonable value, then libraries, for example, are probably going to be willing to contribute and back you. And the Open Library of Humanities has a, a, a library membership model as well so for journal publishing, which has taken off extremely well. I, I imagine a lot of most people here will have been involved with that in some way by now. And another one is, uh, I'd like to mention about 10, 20 different um, things, but the other one I thought I'd bring up is, you might have seen recently, it's an um, initiative called Lingdo Way, which is from the linguistics community. And essentially what happens there is they built up a large fund to be able to pay the APCs for journals in the linguistics community that want to go fully open access. <coughs> so we have, we have journals that have uh, negotiated with their publishers to see if they would be allowed to go open access. Um, if they're not allowed to, they've, they've left those publishers and they've come across to the platform. And it's an initiative that's backed by the, the Dutch government and, and universities, and they put together a fund to pay these, these fees for five years. Um, and there have been a few recently high profile um, moves in that space, but it's, it's a, a good example of the fact that because the fees are, are quite low, um, that kind of initiative can actually get, get underway and is acceptable to the funders to, to do so. So the aim of all of that is then that we try to make a community of all these initiatives working together. Um, the aim of this slide is to, is to talk about um, the benefits of teamwork. Um, the idea of being birds that fly in formation are sort of like 80 percent more energy efficient, etc. And that's kind of the idea of the platform. That all these different initiatives share the same infrastructure, same services, and they network together, and they, they can actually be much more efficient working together. Um, and I, know, I, don't, I believe it or not, a book on rugby, um, which talked about where you know, if a bird falls behind, another bird will go back and help them fly to the front, etc. And the, the motto is no bird left behind. Um, and as a result of that, we have, you know, really well-established presses like UCB on the platform, but we also have a huge number of journals from countries like Sri Lanka. So you have, we're trying to build a proper global community together that are all working towards open access together. And then uh, I was also asked to say what I think the future is, so I just took that a few steps further. Um, and I'm not sure if my video is playing. Oh. Should play. <laughs> there's actually a giant swarm of swallows um, doing crazy things. Okay, for some reason it's getting sick. Um, what that was really just showing is that we, we're actually very, very ambitious about the platform and we don't want to stop with just 10 presses working together. We want to get up into the hundreds and we want those presses to be very successful. So we want to see journals moving, moving away from publishers who don't want to support them and open access or don't have a business model. They should come over and start working with the presses that do have the, the ability to support them. And then all together we can probably bring about a quite disruptive shift. David, I'm with Alexander Street. Our motto at Alexander Street is making silent voices heard, and a big part of that for us is bringing new archive content to the scholarly community. Uh, we see these dusty boxes of archives and we see opportunity. Digitizing them has been in our DNA for a long time. Open access, though, was a new initiative we wanted to engage in. And so we started looking at the landscape of current initiatives in archival open access publishing. And largely, two models appear. The first, government or institution funded. And we know that that's wonderful for OA, but it's also constrained by limited dollars. And then we also saw the sales threshold model that Reveal Digital and others have um, popularized. We, we really like this model. We, we think it's a great way to bring archives open access. But the challenge with the sales threshold model 
is that it's delayed indefinitely. You establish a target of, say, $500,000, and you got to get there. It could take two years, it could take five years, it could take 10 years. So we wanted to uh, embrace a model or try a model that would do something a little different. We also, in talking to faculty and talking to the complex mix of rights holders we deal with, realized that we were running up against a big challenge, which is some of the right holders we deal with are never going to go open access. Some of them are definitely going to go open access. Faculty, however, when they experience our content, regardless of whether it's open access or not, they want it on a unified single platform. Which brings me to our new initiative launching early in 2016, Anthropology Fieldwork Online. So what I want you to imagine is the world's biggest database of field research notes all in one place. If you think about the 20th century, it was seminal for anthropology in defining how the discipline was going to operate through the practice of ethnography. So early in the 20th century, folks like Bronislaw Malinowski uh, wrote these great ethnographies. Later on, people like Margaret Mead wrote ethnographies, and it progressed the practice of the discipline. And for that 200 or 250 page monograph you have now that they've written underneath it are boxes and boxes and boxes of fabulous field notes. When you start diving into them, if you're a geeky anthropologist like I am, you love it. You're thinking, wow, how could we bring this to life? But again, we deal with these complex rights. We have institutions, individuals. We've been in the basements of um, spouses of deceased anthropologists looking at their notes. It's a really interesting, complex web of content rights that we have to navigate. And again, we have to get all of this material digital, discoverable, on a single platform, and when possible, open. So how are we going to do it? We're launching Anthropology Commons. Anthropology Commons, think of a coin. Anthropological Fieldwork Online is one side of the coin. Flip the coin over, that's Anthropology Commons. And both of them are discoverable, searchable on one platform, two sides of a coin. Three ways um, we're making content open access via the Anthropology Commons. The first is, from every sale we make of Anthropological Fieldwork Online, we're contributing 10% to um, sponsoring open access content in the Commons. The second model is our delayed OA model. And these are from some of the archives that have said to us, we have a mission to sustain, we need to generate some revenue, but after a certain period of time, we're willing to go open access. So that's five years in our model. Five years of saleable in Anthropological <laughs> Fieldwork Online, and then it moves over into the Anthropology Commons. And finally is the third, that's sponsored content. And that's where our 10% is going, but also many of the archives we've spoken to have said they'd be willing to underwrite the digitization and indexing costs so their content could be immediately available open access. Also, many of the, um, many of the archives participating in the delayed model have told us they'd like to kick back a bit of their royalty into the sponsorship pool. So how does this work in practice? How many of you know who these folks are? Any of these folks? One or two hands. But again, you're not geeky anthropologists like me. So these are examples of um, archives we are, uh, or pardon me, anthropologists, we are targeting and looking at the archives to bring the content to life. So for example, Ruth Benedict, if this works out for us, and we believe it will, we're very close to an agreement, this will appear immediately in our sponsored content. We're underwriting the cost of bringing that um, immediately available open access, all of her archival content, and it is fascinating stuff. Bronislaw Malinowski, he's the granddaddy. My first anthro course, I had to read uh, Argonauts of the Southern or Western Pacific, can't remember now. That'll be delayed OA. And then Max Gluckman, he's the founder of the Manchester School of Anthropology, and that's coming via the uh, Royal Anthropological Institute, and they have to earn a royalty. So it'll be always in that saleable part of anthropology fieldwork online, but again, 10% is going over into sponsoring content. So that's our model. That's an example of how anthropolo Anthropology Gilbert Online and Anthropology Commons function together as two sides of a coin. So last, future of open access archives. I should have written from my perspective, not from our perspective, but uh, you know, the Library of Congress has said that less than 10% of their content is now digital, let alone open access. And if the Library of Congress is less than 10%, I think we can assume the world's archives are probably around 2%. Um, and, and part of this is archives don't benefit from the need to publish behind open access journals and monographs 
you saw my comment earlier in the slide that archives don't seek tenure. So funding dollars aren't flowing towards um, getting monitored, or pardon me, getting uh, archives open and digital. But on the other hand, I think that makes it an opportunity for innovation because it's not constrained by the various publisher models that define how things are going with journals and monographs, notwithstanding the great new initiatives of my fellow panelists. So I think we're in a time of opportunity for new models and open access archives. I'm a big fan of Ray Kurzweil. A lot of people think he's nuts. He says in 50 or so years, the pace of um, technology innovation and biology innovation will make it so we none of us have to die. It's the singularity, he calls it. And we all go, Ray's crazy. That doesn't make any sense. But Ray says the reason we think he's crazy is because we look at everything in a linear change model. But really, change is exponential, especially with technology. So he says that if you take a step back and you look at the pace of change and its exponential nature, you'll see that it's really moving way faster than you realize. And I believe that's the case with open access archives. I think we're just on the cutting edge of it. There's going to be a lot more creative new innovation. My last note, Anthropology Commons is only the beginning for us. Stay tuned and see what we do in other areas at Alexander Street. Thanks. I, I promised synthesizing comments, and I have no idea how one would synthesize anything from those three very different, uh, but all very exciting presentations. So instead, I'm going to, I'm going to do something different. Um, I'm going to ask three questions to sort of kick off our, our Q&A for you. Um, so first of all, for Allison, uh, my question, and this is actually not so much a question, but more an observation inviting a response. Um, I think it's going to be very interesting to see whether winning over monograph authors to open access models is going to be more or less easy than winning over article authors. Um, to David, I have a more practical question uh, that, that is, I guess, kind of a yes or no question, and that is um, Ubiquity, the Ubiquity Press platform is uh, an open source platform dedicated to open access publishing. My question is, is, is it available as an open source platform to those who wish to do uh, non-OA publishing or, or OA publishing under something other than a CCBY license? And then my question uh, to David about um, anthropological archives is, how are you dealing with the issues of content, um, content that's in the public domain where there may be rights issues that have nothing to do with copyright and have to do with donor agreements with universities or whatever? So, we'll open with those questions and then open it up to everybody else. Um, so I'll kick off talking about the author perspective. I, I think there are ways in which um, the issues with faculty for monographs are both easier and more difficult. Um, the easier side is that the brand that's valued is the university press brand itself. And so the challenge for journals is it's the journal brand and publisher isn't really terribly important to, to the um, academic who's publishing. But the University of California Press brand is really meaningful, so we still have that brand. And interestingly, it's one of the first questions we get asked by faculty, is it still a UC Press book? And if the answer to that is yes, then you, you've made a significant stride forward. You know, at the same time, there is still a lot of, um, I guess there's a lot of misunderstanding. So this comes back to this issue of moving to digital and to um, open access at the same time for monographs. So a lot of misunderstandings among faculty in these fields who are less familiar with the concept of open access in general, perceptions of it, you know, potentially being vanity publishing, pay to publish, um, concerns that it isn't peer reviewed, which of course is an entirely separate concept. And so, you know, you have to be pretty patient in sort of working through some of these issues. We did a survey of over a thousand faculty across the um, North America and Europe as we were developing the model for Luminous, and you know, those range from you know, responses along the lines of where do I send my proposal to the, probably the worst on the other side was one of our um, current authors whose comment was, if UC Press proceeds with this program, I will never publish with you again. So we went ahead. Is this working? So the, the answer is that as Ubiquity Press, we're 100% open access allow non-commercial licenses, right? <coughs> we, we really strongly believe that we're there to um, enable communication not to block it. I think if you're a new publisher and you're not following the idea of access these days, then I'm not quite sure why you do it. You're not there to, you're not enabling public communication. It's, it's 
so the answer to the other part of the question is we, we do have some presses on the network that do occasionally use things like non-commercial licenses because there's sometimes there's no other way to persuade an author to, to publish and, and sometimes that's better than nothing. Um, but we very strongly encourage the press with like the release we would allow them to deviate. Um, and also, they said we are releasing our books platform. Uh, we've, we've produced a, a book production system, um, which is very nice, it's called Brewer. Um, and it allows you know, submission of manuscripts through peer review, copy editing, typesetting, et cetera, to, to publication. And um, we're releasing that as, as open source software, and just people can do anything they like with it. Um, but it does handle open access licenses really well. Try not to fall off the end here. <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah, actually, the, for us, the, the rights with the archives is the easy part. Uh, Rick, you hit on the tough part, which is the, the um, survivors, the relatives, uh, and their concerns about how the content gets used after it's open access, regardless of whether it's in the public domain or not. Some of them are very concerned about commercial uses not taking place. Some don't care. So we have to negotiate, discuss with them the various forms of creative commons, decide what's the right application for them. But another aspect that, that anthropologists would hit on is the communities under study. And that's an even bigger issue because in many cases there are things that were written that weren't true, that were insensitive, uh, and, and sometimes downright offensive. And we have to have very carefully worded and, and very liberally applied in what by liberally applied I mean in favor of the community take down policy around the content. And I'm sure that that's going to happen. Pieces are going to have to come down. All right, there's a microphone in the aisle. If anybody would like to uh, ask a question, please uh, again identify yourself uh, so that we have some context for your question. Good morning, Adamson. I'm an industry consultant. And my question is for Allison. I feel like I'm on a game show. Uh, <laughs> If the, um, if the humanities or social sciences author is being published by you in print, then I'm wondering why there's still resistance to maybe an open access model for the digital version of that in terms of, you know, they're getting all of the authority of the print. It just changes. Um, uh, I'm just wondering about that because it's different from saying this is going to be all open access, all digital. You still have your print for the people who want that. Curious about your experiences with that. Well, we, I mean, we still, so we still publish monographs the traditional route, and those are, you know, with the exception of fields like art history where digital rights can be difficult. Those are always published simultaneously in print and digital publications. Both are for sale. Um, in the luminous model. <coughs> All the different um, digital editions are available free, um, and there's a, a, print, a reasonably priced print version for sale. Um, so I think the the author concerns are, you know, partly. I mean, in the luminous model, they have to come up with the type of publication fee. So that's some, and they don't earn royalties and, and see revenue and so on. Though I think we would all recognise royalties on a an average monograph, and <laughs> I'm not going to buy you that yacht on the Thames. Um, but I, I think the, um, you know, the, the real, what we've tried to do is to leave the choice to the author. So I think, it's, again, you know, it's part of establishing open access as a legitimate way of publishing in the humanities and social sciences and for monographs. We've very deliberately left the decision about how to publish the monograph with the author. So our acquisitions editors, when they're talking to authors about their books, are having a conversation along the lines of, well, you know, we have these two different ways of publishing your book, and here's what Route A looks like, here's what Route B looks like, walking them through, but the ultimate decision is left 100% to the author. Now, as open access becomes more ubiquitous in these fields, that may change, but I think right now that's very important to establish it as a, as a credible model. I'm Bob Schatz with Biomed Central, which is a very different area of open access than you folks are talking about. Also, I'm interested in the internal culture and whether you had a sales job when you launched all this with your own editors and how they either embraced or resisted the idea of, of the Luminous model. I think, I mean, there, 
internally, I think um, there was, we didn't have resistance I think by the time we got to Lucas. I mean, I've been at UC Press nearly five years, and the first two or three years I was there, we went through some pretty substantial changes across the organization, as many publishers and presses have done. And so, you know, when I came to UC Press, I think there was very much an attachment to the physical print artifact, the, the beautiful books that we produced. And, you know, we remain very committed to that for a portion of what we do. Um, the point that I had, you know, tried to establish from early on is that's all we do. Our future's going to be pretty limited. And so I think, you know, a lot of those issues internally and sort of letting go of some of those things, the things that we had already dealt with. Um, you know, that said, I think it resonates more with some of our editors than it does with others. We have a handful of editors who are incredibly passionate about it and are out talking to authors and campus, on campus the whole time, and others who I think, you know, still went into um, something of the old model. So I think, you know, from that sense, we, we represent our, our different stakeholders and author groups. You know, that said, I think we've had one place where we have had great support is from the university and from our faculty editorial committee who have been you know, really sort of crucial in advising and guiding us as we develop the model. <laughs> Lisa Hopkins with Texas A&M, Central Texas. And I'm an acquisitions librarian, and I guess I'm sort of wondering, just from a practical point of view, from me sitting in my office ordering books, um, how will I get your books? On um, what platform are they going to be available to an aggregator? How, uh, a subscription? I mean, how, how do I get them in my library, and how will my students find them? Well, the, the digital version is available free, and it's available on the Ubiquity Press platform. Um, in terms of getting in and out into the world, um, there are sort of two aspects maybe to, to mention. The first is getting in into library systems. So we have we are creating the, all the records, mark records, and so on for all of these books. Right now, they are available on the Luminous platform. We are currently in different discussions with sort of third-party vendors to look at ways in which we can have them push out those records so that they fit into the library workflow as it currently exists. And I think that will obviously make it much easier for, for you and for us. Um, in terms of being able to find the books, they're available in all good bookstores. Um, so if you go online onto Amazon, Barnes & Noble, you'll find the books, you'll find the for sale book, and you'll find the free digital book. Too. So I've watched Luminous with some interest from a distance since your announcement, and when the books came out a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago, I went, oh look, there they are. But um, what struck me was how quickly they came out. Uh, and maybe at UC Press you do that, maybe you're that fast all the time, in which case I want to come take notes on how you did that. Uh, but I was curious as to whether they were books already in process that flipped to the Luminous model, um, or whether there is something in the um, digital production and delivery that speeds up time to, to market or time to audience. And the question that Brian might have something to say, I'm wondering about that time from when they get started to when they reach the world. Um, is it faster than print? Uh, is there, are there time savings as well? And of course, we don't see cost savings, but are the time savings? <laughs> We, yes, I mean, we, as you know, we only sort of announced the new program back at the beginning of the year, and then nine months later we published six books. So, so there were a couple of those that were complete manuscripts that we had come in after that, but there were four that flipped over. There were authors who were interested in flipping from the contract they signed for a traditional book. So that's what enabled us to kind of launch that quickly. That said, you know, our production schedule is shorter for Luminous. It's about five to six months for a typical book, and we're doing it in around three to four months for luminous titles. So there is an advantage there, maybe not a significant one. Um, but you know, when I came to UC Press, we were producing books in 12 to 15 months, so it's sort of come a long way since those days. 
direct or import of that new bitcoin address was something like 16 speakers. We had this horrible thing in the UK called the research um, assessment framework, um, which um, means you, you have to have thanks. You have to have books out by uh, a certain period to be uh, assessed for your institution's funding, etc. And that drives people crazy. So we had to do one very, very quickly. Um, but generally, we just try to be as streamlined as we possibly can. We, um, the supplies we use are the same supplies we use for journals. Um, so, for example, typesetting turnarounds there are about a day and a half for articles. So, if you week for a book manuscript. So, we we try to, to yeah, share as many services as possible there and then not have, we don't have any legacy orientated um, workflows. So, we are just very conscious of being as good as we can. But um, I don't think we are necessarily different. There's no real major difference between the city. It's a different um, Dear. Uh, Anika Walls from Virginia Tech. Um, this question is for David um, Parker. And I'm wondering, um, some of our faculty are interested in incorporating um, archival images and artifacts into their work. Um, is that possible through architecture commons? Do they have to ask permission? Is it a fair use question or are they openly licensed, not just free online? The, uh, uh, by the way, I had, I had this incredible urge to answer the last question. For those of you who know me well, I used to have my own publishing company and I, I left it and went to work for Alexander Street, which was a complete departure. I used to be a book guy, so I just wanted to really, I wanted to jump in on that one. Um, no, those content items will be avail available for use by faculty in their courses. And also, uh, a further iteration of the anthropology commons that I didn't get into in the presentation trying to stay to seven minutes is that we are and will be encouraging the uh, addition of other content from, let's, shall we say, lesser known anthropologists. I actually wrote an ethnography. I'm not sure anybody wants to see my field work notes, but uh, maybe they'll go up there someday. Did I answer that? You look sort of like I didn't. Can you address their use in other publications? No, they are Creative Commons, sorry. I thought you meant just using the material in teaching, not in, in their publications. Sorry. Okay, last question, I think, we're gonna let you go. Elizabeth Gates from Brock University in Canada. I have a question for Ubiquity Press. So your APC is $450 US, right? Which is awesome. Um, how are you able to have such a cheap APC? Um, what, what is different about your process than, for example, another gold open access journal that's charging significantly more? And what do you feel the influence of your lower APC might be on gold, app, gold open access publishing? Um, well, we set up the company as, as, as low cost as we possibly could. Um, because we, didn't, we, we saw the higher APCs as a barrier to open access. Um, so we, we use things like open source, etc. We don't have a lot of legacy systems that big publishers have. We don't have subscriptions for print uh, and things like that. We don't make 42 profits, unfortunately, um, which also helps to, to push the fees up. Um, but also, also when larger publishers tell you it costs three or four thousand pounds to publish an article, they're, they're, that, that's not true. It doesn't cost that much, but they, 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 they're quite happy to <coughs> take more money and pay for other things in the business, which is also legitimate, but they, I think it's good to have transparency about what people are really paying for. Um, so what we would really like to see is a transparent marketplace for processing uh, charges and charges so that authors and their institutions, their funders can make a decision about whether this is a good place to publish or not, um, and whether that's a good use of, their, of the funds that are coming from their research budget or their library budget. So when, when we start being transparent and showing a breakdown of our costs, we're kind of hoping we'd be able to push our participants in that direction. It doesn't necessarily happen, but that, um, our diagram of the APC does get um, posted along the internet and so forth as an example of how it can be cheaper. All right, please join me in thanking our excellent panel.